Hi, welcome everybody to the College of Podiatry and Phelan Healthcare uh, webinar on infection in the diabetic foot. I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you all today to this evening's uh, session. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Matthew Malone as uh, our main presenter for this evening. Uh, Matthew qualified from the University of Salford, uh, but moved to Australia um, some 15 years ago, where his career has really moved from strength to strength. And he's now a, a PhD doctor um, and concentrating around wound infection. So it's a really uh, excellent speaker we've got for you this afternoon. Um, how the webinar is going to work is I'm going to do a, a short introduction presentation around the International Working Group guidelines. And then Matthew's going to do the bulk of the work around the, the role of covert infection uh, in the diabetic foot. And then we're going to come together and have, answer some of the questions that you pose during the chat and also some questions that have been raised beforehand. So hopefully we'll keep you for about 45 minutes to 50 minutes and hope you have a great evening. So without further ado, I'll start with my slides. Um, as I say, I'm Paul Chadwick. I'm the clinical director at the College of Podiatry. I'm also the visiting professor at Birmingham City University. And really, I'm going to cover the infection, the overt infection in the diabetic foot. Just to set the scene, um, most of you will have seen this uh, slide before. It's about the, the sort of epidemic of diabetes that's occurring across the world and this developing uh, epidemic and tsunami of diabetes that we're seeing in the world. And this growth uh, where we see areas, particularly in the northeast and uh, Middle East and North Africa, where there's a significant amount of people who are developing diabetes. So, for example, in, in certain countries in the Middle East, such as Saudi Arabia, we're seeing a 50% prevalence in people over 30 with diabetes. So it's a developing condition. And as a consequence of a developing number of people with diabetes, we're also seeing an increase in the number of people with diabetes foot related complications. If We take this back to what's happening in the UK um, uh, and the country that we're working in. There's around 8,500 amputations, minor or major, per year in the UK between uh, 2013 to 2016. Around 160 amputations per week. And that's increased from the 135 amputations per week. Um, that's a decrease in the number of major, but an increase in the number of minor. And actually, this figure of 23 amputations a day has increased in the, in the two years to 25 amputations a day. So the, the figures have actually increased since this slide was written. More importantly, as well as this one billion cost that the number of amputations and the management of diabetic foot disease um, imparts is the social care cost. And we know that that's around 14 billion pounds for people who can no longer contribute to the social system, uh, can no longer be employed, for example, and therefore costing the NHS and the social care system around 14 billion pounds. So there's a major impact on patient, both patients in terms of amputation and comorbidities, but also on society itself. One of the things I try to bring into these uh, presentations is the mortality associated with diabetic foot disease. If you look at this slide, and it's a very good slide, I feel, and it demonstrates the, the sort of campaign and the awareness around some of the more common cancers that we see in society, such as prostate, breast, and Hodgkin's lymphoma. But when you look at the five-year mortality associated with neuropathic foot ulceration, so that, that person who attends uh, your, di your diabetic foot clinic with a neuropathic foot ulcer, around 50% of them will be dead within a five year period, which is larger than all the three common cancers combined. We don't see campaigns or social awareness around this, but the association of diabetic foot disease and, and mortality needs to be, the awareness needs to be raised across society generally. So moving on to what we're here to really talk about is the management of diabetic foot ulcers and the local management of diabetic foot ulcers. We know that um, this presentation has been named Time is Tissue. And normally that clock might move around, but it hasn't today. It must be stalled. It's probably because it doesn't know whether it's in Australia or in the UK. But we know the infection is the destroyer of the diabetic foot. It's the, usually the final pathway to amputation. So often people have a neuropathic foot ulcer, neuroischemic foot ulcer, and they get infection on top of that, and that drives the amputation. So. Let's think about what the guidance tells us about the management and diagnosis of infection in the diabetic foot. Clinicians should evaluate the patient presenting with a foot wound on three levels. The patient as a whole, do they have any systemic signs and symptoms of infection? The affected foot or limb, is there any spreading cellulitis? And finally, the infected wound, what's the depth, the position of the, of the, of the wound and any associated cellulitis or redness with that? So think about it, not just about the foot, but also around the three areas, the limb and the body. 
when we're performing a diagnosis, um, when we're undertaking a diagnosis, it should be based on the presence of at least two classic signs and symptoms of inflammation. Heat, redness, pain, swelling, induration or prurient secretions. So heat, redness, pain, swelling or discharge. And we need to remember that pain may be masked due to, neur due to neuropathy in patients with diabetes. So two of these five indicates a diagnosis of infection. What you should do then is document and classify the severity of the infection based on its extent and depth and the presence of any systemic findings of infection. So remember, it's important that infection is based, is a clinical diagnosis based on two of the five signs and symptoms of inflammation, heat, redness, pain, swelling, prurient or indurent uh, secretions. So two of those five, can, within, when the patient is at risk, it gives you a diagnosis of infection. You obviously need to exclude things like trauma if someone's fell over and fractured the foot. That will give you some pain and swelling and inflammation. When a patient with a wound where you've got heat, redness, pain, swelling or discharge, two of those five, you can make that diagnosis of infection. So when we're classifying infection, we can move through four stages. One is no infection, so there's no heat, no redness, no pain, no swelling or no, or no discharge, or only one of those. So we don't see any with this picture here. There's no redness there. There's no associated um, heat or swelling. So we've just got a nice wound that's got a little bit of local maceration, but it's on its way to healing. We go from no infection to mild infection. And that's where we have a, um, a, a, an ulcer with less than two centimeters of erythema around the wound, but with no deep structure and no systemic signs. So there's two centimeters of redness, um, some swelling, some heat or pain or some discharge, but there's no deep structure or no systemic signs. So there's no tendon, there's no bone. If we move on, we then have the moderate infection where there you've got more than the two centimeters of redness or there's deep tissue involvement. So the patient may have bone or tendon involvement. And if you see this picture here, you can see that there's an ulcer there on the uh, dorsum of that little toe, but the ulcer tracks right the way through into the interdigital area. So the ulcer involves bone, and if you look to the x-ray, you can see bony changes. So the patient's got a moderate infection, but crucially, the patient feels well. So there's no systemic signs and symptoms of sepsis. And then we go on to severe. Uh, severe infection is where we have um, spreading infection. So that redness spreading beyond the two centimeters. We also ha may have deep structural involvement, such as bone and tendon, but also crucially, we have signs and symptoms of sepsis. So patients would have an elevated temperature, an elevated white cell count, etc. So these, you can see that gradual progression from no infection, mild infection, moderate infection to severe infection. And that's, we should be classifying patients according to this system. One of the things the International Working Group does help us with is this latest guideline in 2019 is that sometimes it is difficult to suspect frank infection if patients do have neuropathy or a, a, a lowered immune response so they don't get the classic signs and symptoms of inflammation. So what they suggest in that in a person with diabetes and possible foot infection for whom the clinical examination, so you can't detect whether there's any heat, redness, pain, swelling or discharge or the signs are slightly reduced, is equivocal or uninterpretable Consider ordering an inflammatory serum biomarker such as CRP, ESR, and perhaps procalcitonin as an adjunctive measure for establishing the diagnosis. So remember, it's a clinical diagnosis, but if you're unsure, these are the other things that you might want to throw in. In a person with diabetes and suspected osteomyelitis of the foot, we recommend the combination of the probe to bone test. So that's the easier using a blunt edged probe to palpate the base of the wound to see if you can feel bone. The, an ESR or CRP or procalcitonin and plain x-rays as the initial studies to diagnose osteomyelitis. And that's a strong recommendation from the uh, International Working Group with uh, moderate infection to uh, moderate evidence to support it. So how do we treat the um, infection, the overt infection of the diabetic foot? Well, we need to consider what the likely or proven causative pathogens are and their antibiotic susceptibilities. We know that in a, an antibiotic naive patient, for example, where the wound is fairly new, that we'll most likely see gram positive cocci. So in the first line, we would tend to use something such that's active against a, a gram positive cocci, such as uh, Staph aureus. So we'd use something like fluoxacillin. We then also need to work out what the clinical severity of the infection is. Remember the mild, moderate or severe, that would both change what antibiotics we use, but also uh, the administration route of the antibiotics. We need to consider the published evidence of any efficacy of the agent for diabetic foot infections. 
and crucially in this area of antibiotic resistance and um, and the comorbidities, comorbidities that people have, we need to consider the risk of adverse events, including collateral damage to the commensal flora um, and the likelihood of drug interactions, particularly in older people where there's lots of polypharmacy going on. We also need to consider in uh, agent availability and financial costs. Some antibiotics are significantly more expensive and have uh, limited efficacy above something that's fairly cheap. So we need to consider all these things in the round. So when we're thinking, and I'm, I'm going to move into Matthew's territory here, where we're talking about the use of topical antimicrobials, but they are becoming much more popular, and, and the one I use a lot is flaminol, and they're becoming more popular, as I've described, such as the, the presence of antimicrobial resistance. Where antibiotic penetration to tissues is difficult, such as patients with significant PAD, and we're, just, we're worried about whether the antibiotics are going to get adequate tissue penetration. And where there are no signs and symptoms of infection, so where there's no heat, redness, pain, swelling, discharge, but we suspect a bacterial bio burden or biofilm is suspected. And I think the real key to this is this overt versus covert scenario that we're going to talk about in Matthew's presentation. So this is a foot I would describe as uninfected um, to the naked eye. Um, there's no heat, there's no redness, no pain, no swelling, no discharge, but the wound is stalled, stuck. So I suspect clinically that there is a bio burden there. Um, you look at the granulation tissue, it doesn't look overly healthy. There is some local maceration, but there's nothing there that can tell us other than clinical experience that there seems to be some kind of biofilm or bio burden there that's preventing wound healing and keeping that wound stuck in a chronic inflammatory state. So if we're thinking about biofilm management, and, and Matthew's going to go into much more detail about how we do this and how we manage this, the main two principles are reducing the biofilm burden and preventing reconstitution of the biofilm. And one of the ways we do the reducing the burden is through debridement, which is the podiatrists do. And the way we prevent the biofilm formation is the use of antimicrobial agents. And just to focus on one particular one here, which is flaminil. And there it shows that once you get the concentration of the um, active ingredient, which is the glucooxidase, lactoperioxidase, and glycol, it prevents a beyond 0 0.0125 um, weight per volume of GLG, you actually get that prevention of uh, the formation of a, a biofilm, in this case, a Staph aureus biofilm. That's my science bits because um, it's not my specialist area. So at this point, I'd like to pass over to the expert, who's Dr. Matthew Malone, to talk really very much more about the, um, the role of biofilm and the role of covert infection, how we manage that as podiatrists moving forward. Matthew, over to you. Yeah, so thanks, Paul. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um... I'm Matthew Malone. As Paul touched on, I've trained um, at Salford University, uh, qualified as a podiatrist. I uh, went on to do my master's at Huddersfield and then, and then finally did my PhD in microbiology um, at Sydney. Um, currently, I uh, left the, the UK in 2010, spent most of my time in Manchester, and had two years in the Middle East at an army hospital um, in a, a specialist limb salvage unit and then sort of jumped across the pond to Sydney where I've been now for probably the past nine, ten years. I work at a, a place, funny enough, called Liverpool Hospital. It's in Sydney. Um, we have uh, one of the largest diabetic foot services. We're a national centre of excellence. And then I take my cap off, walk across the road, um, where I have my research labs and we have a full uh, PC2 lab where uh, we do most of our research now, which is based around basically trying to better understand uh, infections in wounds and, and trying to understand maybe some of the cellular and biological reasons why ulcers don't heal. But today I've been tasked from Paul to talk about biofilms. That, that was pretty much what my PhD uh, was on. And, and so... Um, I'm going to guide you through the next 20, 30 minutes, uh, ho hopefully with, with some information that you'll find clinically useful as well. I think over the past well, at least five to 10 years, we've, we've seen this big, massive biofilm bandwagon, lots of products aimed at it, lots of people talking about it. I think we've had a, a little bit of misinterpretation of what biofilms are, and some of that's probably the name itself of biofilms. But essentially, look, they, they are just bacteria. Um, but they behave a little bit differently. They have slightly different metabolism and growth. So as Paul touched on, we're talking about covert infection and they're typically what we come 
to assume is being caused by planktonic free floating bacteria. They have a, a lot faster metabolism and growth rates. They can produce uh, large amounts of virulence factors which incite a host response that we clinically see as inflammation uh, and a clinical infection. But biofilm bacteria are different. They, they tend to aggregate like clumps of grapes. Um, they can attach to a surface uh, that can be a living surface or a non-living surface, but they can also attach just to each other in aggregates or clumps and just float in wound fluid. One of the features is they can create their own sort of protective matrix that we call the EPS or extracellular polymeric substance. Um, and when they come together as an aggregate or as a community, they start to behave differently. They, they alter their gene expression for their behavior and for their growth and they slow their growth rates down. And their behavioral changes that you see sort of bring around these quite unique characteristics um, that we see in particular protection from host defenses. So the host immune system doesn't do a good job at trying to clear them. And they become highly tolerant to many forms of antimicrobials, antibiotics, and disinfectants to, to many, many times the therapeutic concentrations required to kill planktonic microorganisms. And the research with, that I've done in the past has shown that probably uh, over 70 to 80% of chronic non-healing wounds that are not responding to standard of care um, are li likely have um, biofilm um, complications. And when we talk about biofilm, I want to make this really, really important that the key message is when we talk about biofilms in wounds, what we're actually talking around is chronic infections because that's what biofilms induce. They induce chronic localized infection uh, in, in a different clinical picture than we may see than an acute rip raging infection that Paul's touched on and, and generally tend to have a lot less um, observable features or covert features um, and, and we're going to touch on on that a little bit and that's typically because they they change the way in which they behave and when they cause or in wounds and cause chronic infections some of the downstream effects of them being there and causing a chronic infection is that they may contribute to delayed healing as well there's been um, a little bit of research that has tried to link causality with biofilms. So biofilms directly induce um, a, a delayed healing. And there's, there's a little bit of information out there that you could probably look through through Google with. But our own group have been doing quite a bit of stuff recently with, with tissue biopsies from foot ulcers. And in particular, we've been looking at something called RNA sequencing or genomics in a, in a similar way that we've been seeing them use it for COVID. And what we've actually found from these tissue samples in non-healing um, ulcers is that there's a significant upregulation of genes associated with biofilm um, in, in patients that turn up with non-healing wounds. And as we start to treat them through our standard of care measures, we see that the number of genes for biofilm and something called quorum sensing, which is the bacteria talking to each other, that they generally downtrend in healing wounds. And in non-healing wounds, those genes for biofilm generally stay to a similar level, if not increase. Um, and the same um, is with these quorum sensing transcripts. And interestingly, as I talked about behavioral changes, we can see that there's significant down regulation in virulence transcripts. One of the major reasons of biofilm for being in that sort of phenotype or that state of living, the slow growth, the reduce or reduction in genes with virulence is that they want to survive almost in a symbiotic way with the tissue so that they don't invoke this big host response and so that they don't want to sort of destroy everything in its path. They just, just they want to stay there and stay there in a, in a quiet fashion. So when we talk about biofilms, we're talking about chronic wounds, uh, chronic infections. And so I ask myself is, you know, should we be concerned about chronic infections? And the answer is yes. 
It's yes, because typically what we find in chronic infections is that there's an overuse and prolonged use of antibiotics, and that can lead to selective pressures for antimicrobial resistance. We often find that patients have poor clinical outcomes, a poor quality of life, and it, there's a significant increase in healthcare expenditure. And a prime example of this is patients who have chronic infections with uh, medical device related um, or indwelling, sorry, indwelling medical devices, such as your hip implants. Now, if they get a biofilm infection around that hip implant, generally that's a poor outcome for a patient because what you have to do in most cases is remove that implant completely. That's a poor outcome for a patient in terms of his mobility. It's a significant cost to the healthcare system to remove that and then having to do maybe um, a revision and so forth and the, and the patient's quality of life. So if we put that into wounds, we see a very, very similar pattern with patients who have chronic wounds for a long, long, long periods of time and the in and out of your clinic. Um, and so the question is, or the answer is, we should be concerned about biofilms because they are a cause of chronic infection. Now, evidence is gathering for the role of biofilms in human health and disease. We're finding them everywhere because we're getting a lot, lot better at different techniques to identify them. And in particular, my own, gro my own group has done a significant amount of work in the diabetic foot, wound, skin, soft tissue and bone space. We've uh, some of the first to identify biofilms as a cause of diabetic foot osteomyelitis. We found that biofilms are ubiquitous in non-healing diabetic uh, foot ulcers. Uh, we have uh, colleagues of mine who've done some work on biofilms as cause um, of capsular contracture for breast implants, and some colleagues who've done uh, stuff with uh, orthopedic hardware, and our own work in particular recently on doing uh, uh, biofilm research in vascular devices and here, here's a, a really nice image of an infected axillary femoral uh, stent. This uh, stent went down in a patient, and when they took the stent out, what they found was this thrombus. And when we looked at the thrombus under scanning electron microscope, that thrombus was just literally a floating clot of uh, biofilm. So the problem with biofilms in skin, soft tissue, and bone is we cannot see them. That's contrary probably to quite a lot of rhetoric we may have read or heard about biofilms um, being this layer of slime, this, this translucent layer that just slides across the entire surface of the wound. And that is just not accurate. Biofilms are just bacteria. We cannot see bacteria. They are not visible to the naked eye. And therefore, it really makes us, it really makes it difficult to appreciate where biofilms and even just microorganisms in general might be spatially orientated in a wound. And that's, that's quite important that we'll come on to touch um, in a little while because it, it has effects on how we treat them. But for those who maybe just wanna see some of the clinical features of what, what we think are, are probably reliable enough to, to gauge our naked eye observations from um, that, that there's a paper which we published here with, with um, some esteemed colleagues in, in the American Diabetes Association, just provides some general clues and tips. As Paul said, very much, you know, infection and diagnosing uh, infection is, is a clinical diagnosis. It's done from our eyes, uh, smell and touch. Uh, and so actually one of the best ones that I find for looking or trying to determine whether I'm, I'm dealing with a chronic infection is maybe a patient like this who's developed uh, an infection in his in his toe, went for an amputation, you know, that, that amputation, um, he comes out of hospital, seems to be going well, and then it just stalls, and then he gets these flare-ups, and he has some antibiotics, and it gets better, and he goes off the antibiotics, and then it flares up again once he's off them, and that sort of process seems to repeat quite a few times, and when that happens, it should smack you in the face, because that is a chronic infection and it's likely being driven by biofilm. So we can't see them, they're tolerant to many treatments. Um, and so um, what does this mean at a clinical level? You first of all need to spot that you're dealing with a chronic infection. So you need to understand the infection. Are we dealing with acute infections that cause, you know, maybe acute cellulitis that respond 
very quickly in cases to just single therapy, such as an antibiotic? Or are we dealing with a chronic infection caused by biofilm that's tolerant to, to many things? And so we have to do lots of different strategies. So we need to understand how best to eradicate or control the source. And Paul's touched on this a little bit. And a, a key strategy in the management of wound infections is to eliminate or control the source of infection. And infectious disease practice, we, we, we turn this source control. Now that refers to all the physical measures used to control the nidus of a, an invasive infection and, and to restore the optimal function to that area, which would be wound repair. And if we apply the same principle to wound care, then, then basically the nidus of infection is the wound or ulcer tissue. And so source control is therefore physical removal of all of that infected tissue. Um, uh, and we have to do that in, in essence to also help augment the way in which the host immune response uh, can come in and also um, try and gain um, adequate pathogen clearance. And so we see source control in many different areas. Brushing our teeth, for example, is, is the number one on the top of my list. We brush our teeth twice a day with a toothbrush. That's mechanical debridement. And we do that to prevent biofilm formation um, forming on, on, on our teeth or in enamel because that leads to dental caries. And then once we brushed our teeth and physically or mechanically disrupted the biofilm, we use a mouthwash to rinse away any loose planktonic microorganisms. And, and, and the, the same goes on in different areas, in particularly in the environment. And here we see that biofilm builds up on uh, the, the, the um, ship's hulls, and that can reduce, uh, in, sorry, that can increase drag by 10%, and, and so the, the fuel bills go up. And, and so they do biofilm measures by basically trying to remove barnacles and biofilm and then paint them with anti-biofilm paints. So we use very similar principles that we try and bring into wound care. So part of this management of biofilm in wounds, I was part of a, a global expert group and we published a consensus guidelines back in 2017 now. And um, one of the key things we developed from this was something called the step down approach. And it come from being in a room with guys and saying, you know, what often happens when we're in clinic is we try these things, we'll try this. And if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll try the next thing. And if that doesn't work, we'll try the next thing. And we sat there and said, well, we know how tolerant biofilms are. So maybe we just have to flip that paradigm on its head. And maybe we should try everything we can really aggressively at the start. And if we start to get traction, then we can actually then start to tailor off. So let's throw everything we've got at it. And, and when we see any response, we can tailor off. And the key thing, the most pivotal thing that we put here is aggressive debridement, physical removal of biofilm aggregates, followed by antiseptic, local antiseptic therapy, um, managing host factors such as offloading and compression, um, and where required, uh, obtaining appropriate cultures, and if, if we need systemic uh, antibiotics. And then as we go through this phase of where we're doing all of these multi um, strategies, that if we're seeing movements in the wound, we see improvements in the quality of granulation, less exudate, et cetera, that we can maybe start to tailor off how frequent we, frequently we do this. And so as an example, I, I have a select group of patients who come through the foot service who will have very complex chronic wounds who may have had them for months and months everyone has thrown everything at it and it's not getting better uh, and i will have them come back into clinic two to three times a week if i need to to physically and aggressively debride the wound and it's a different concept because we've been trained through a sort of health economies um, where we want to see patients less and less because it means that, that it's more cost effective. But actually for this group of patients, it just doesn't work very well. If you debride them once or twice a week, by the time they come back, you'll find that all these microorganisms have just gone back to the starting uh, loads that you had them there. So you've got to break this cycle. You've got to get on top of the nidus, the source and to do that sometimes requires very frequent hands-on with the patients for aggressive debridement. 
And then obviously maybe as you start to get traction and the wound starts to look like it's improving, it's reducing in size, all of those other metrics, then maybe you can do more maintenance debridement where you want to see them once or twice a week. And as I touched on really, really importantly, you know, the, the things we're looking at with the bacteria, it's not the only thing going on with that person. The biofilm didn't cause a chronic wound. Other things cause those chronic wounds. Um, uh, the, the poor host uh, immunity, uh, you know, peripheral neuropathy, a lack of offloading, nutrition, mechanical stress, friction, social or environmental factors and perfusion. So all of these things, as Paul touched on, is you have to go and tick off all of these things as well. It's not just I'm going to debride. Um, I'm going to stick maybe this antimicrobial on and it's going to get better. You, you've got to actually start tackling all of these things in as well. And that's part of approaching the patient from a holistic approach. But coming up to tools of the trade, because literally, you know, we really talk about debridement being being the mainstay, the core, the foundation of of. Uh, anti-biofilm treatment because there's no one single effective magic bullet topical agent for want of a better word that can completely eradicate and move biofilm and so in the absence of that if we take it again to like the hip implant you've just got to remove the implant and the same concept is a, what I'm coming around to with tissue is maybe you just have to remove as much or as everything you can with regards to that wound tissue and the best way of doing that is through um, debridement and as podiatrists this is something which I think we excel in and have a unique opportunity um, to to really impact the the way we manage our patients with regards with, with chronic infections uh, we have excellent debridement skills and I think that that by using more topical local approaches to try and manage these chronic infections what we actually are able to do is reduce the unnecessary need for more systemic measures uh, and this is a video uh, of me just doing a, a debridement for someone who had a, a chronic biofilm infection um, he would um, develop uh, acute flares every now and again that would settle down with with antibiotic therapy. We'd stop it, but the wound would never heal. It had significant malodor, really poor quality tissue uh, in that, that wound base. Um, uh, and we're just highly suspicious of him, of, of him having um, a biofilm um, involvement. And so as, as normal stuff, we, we just work on the peri wound first. Um, You'll, you'll see me using a dermal curette, and this, this is what the dermatologist used to remove skin tags. And, you know, when I left Salford, I, I left with only knowing what a 15 blade or a 10 blade was, and I never picked up a 10 blade because it was like wielding a machete. Um, and, and then this changed my life. It was, it's uh, like Peter Kay, it was like garlic bread. Um, this is my mainstay uh, tool that I use on, on many types of wounds. It's, it's a really, really nice way to get both peri wound and then also to work into the ulcer base. And so what we know from samples of tissue samples that I take frequently in clinic, that we, we think this really sort of granulation tissue stuff here is, oh, it might look quite healthy and stuff, but actually, you know, look, there is a huge amount of microbial load that's hanging around in these. And you've actually got to get in there and also um, try to curette and debride that, that wound bed as much as you can. Now, you sort of look at these patients and you go, well, why would you not do surgical uh, debridement? And, and in a lot of patients where I can, we will promote surgical debridement as our first option um, because it's significantly faster at resolving and removing the source of infection because you can be more aggressive. But there's also reality. Many of our patients don't want surgery. If every patient we had with a chronic wound had to come in theatre, there'd be no theatre time. And so we do more conservative measures where we have to stage our debridements uh, and do it on a risk assessment where, you know, we don't just go in and try to remove everything because we will not be able to control um, any hemostasis, for example. So we're doing staged debridements here where we, 
we just work on as much tissue, non-viable tissue as we can, uh, and then we'll augment that with, with topical um, antimicrobials. So I'm still working in here, trying to get in some of the undermining, trying to get in, in, in some of the edges, and then I start to get to work on the base and just actually just physically curating that base. Um, and, and again, the thing with biofilm is they don't just form on the surface of wounds. They will form deeper and penetrate and move into tissue. So some of your success may be dependent on the level of invasiveness of, of biofilm. And, and therefore, it may take you quite a while to be able to get in and get uh, the depth that, that you want as, as the patient comes in um, on, under each visit. And again, sometimes where we're not winning, we just have to say, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to do something surgical. So on the right hand side, you can see that that's what it looks like once we're finished. And then this is where we will then start to augment um, topical um, therapies. The same again, a patient with a chronic wound. This guy had four revisions in uh, as an inpatient, four revisions for infection that was just not resolving. Now that tells you that this is a, a, a classical chronic infection where the surgeons have tried to maintain as much local surgery as they can without going to a BKA. And every time they took one section off, the chronic infection just reared its head again and they had to go for the next section and the next section until they, they did a, TM, a transmit amputation. And even then you can see the, the significant amount of poor quality granulation um, we can see this is non-viable here, this flap, and actually we thought that we'd have to go back in and revise this as well. The significant amount of slough, which is not caused by biofilm, it's caused by the edema in the leg, but biofilm and microorganisms love this sort of uh, environment. And so we have to go in uh, and again, um, try and clean this up the best we can. And in these cases where it's a really large expansive area, we do like hydrosurgical debridement in the outpatient setting. Uh, this is my colleague, Tabby, who's a vascular surgeon. Funny enough, she's, she's from Birmingham. And uh, we have a, a, the, the Little Britain show in, in our clinic. Uh, and we're doing some really, really uh, cool stuff to keep these patients out of hospital, out of having elective surgeries by uh, performing them uh, on an outpatient um, basis. And what we want to do here is just try to remove as much non-viable tissue as we can um, and, and try to basically in doing so remove as much uh, bacteria, microorganisms, both planktonic and biofilm. It's important to recognize that these wounds will not just harbor biofilm, you will have biofilm and planktonic microorganisms. Now the problem is with these wounds like this, you can't see where the biofilm are gonna be. So you might clean all here and you might miss a little pocket of them here or you might miss a little pocket of them there and so the problem is with that is that biofilms can then maybe reform. And so this was part of the consensus guideline that says that debridement is one of the most important treatment strategies, but it doesn't remove all the biofilm and it doesn't remove all the biofilm probably because you just can't see everything. You can't appreciate where it is. And so you may miss pockets. So this research by a colleague man, Randy Walcott, shows that when you do a debridement, the load of the microorganisms drops. But because you probably don't get rid of them all, and um, what happens is biofilms can start to reconstitute after 24 hours and be fully reformed again by 72 hours. So we talk about having this two to three day window where once you've performed debridement, um, you, the biofilms um, are one more susceptible to treatments, but two, if you don't do anything, will reform. And that's why I might get them back two or three times a week to try and beat this from happening because you get them back after a week or two and what's happened is biofilm the, the level and load of microorganisms just comes back to the original number um, and this again is by another colleague john lantis a vascular surgeon in in new york and what he's shown is that by doing a debridement um, he thought that he would remove significant amounts of of microbial loads but actually the pre and post levels or amount of bacteria following 
De Bridemann was not as much as what he thought and there were still things left in the wound. And this could explain maybe why surgical wounds go in. They come out looking really nice, but then maybe after two or three weeks, they just stall and stop. The potential explanation for that maybe is that biofilm has reconstituted in there. And that's why we talk about then, once you've done a debridement, trying to augment that debridement with using topical strategies. Now, this is this is an area which, which is a little controversial in that the, the levels of evidence for most topical antimicrobials that we use in clinical practice is, is highly variable. This is a study we've done, and I want to hopefully point you to this so, so that, that you can go and have a read of this paper. And it was a systematic review and meta-analysis by one of my PhD students. And we, we went through the data and looked at all the literature with, with topical agents that had been used in wounds for biofilm. And um, pretty much what we found from over 640 articles is we, we whittled them down to ones that, that were included in the eligibility. And we found that that pretty much um, in vitro testing, so doing lab models, accounted for 90% of the evidence. The problem with in vitro testing is it's great to control the environment and have a look at what happens under controlled circumstances, but they are a screen, and a screen being a quick test to show whether this seems to work under control conditions or not. But it doesn't mean that's how it's gonna work clinically in a human being. So 90% of all evidence for topical antimicrobials in wound care is from lab-based studies. There's some animal models, but not much. And actually my group, uh, the virtually the only groups that have done um, in vivo biofilm testing in humans using appropriate measures to, to look at the effects. And it's just not a lot. So I would urge you to go and have a look at this. It's a really good read and we'll, we'll set the scene nicely for you. And in coming back through that, in particular, there is a significant movement towards using wound cleansing uh, solutions and irrigation solutions, surfactant and non-surfactant, antimicrobial or non-antimicrobial. And this is a paper I published with colleagues where we did in vitro animal model and human studies um, looking at testing wound solutions against a variety of lab models, lab biofilm models, animal models and human. And in the lab models, what we found was most cases patients will test, or mo most companies will test the, their agents at 24 hours and say, here you go, we killed this amount of biofilm after 24 hours. And we said, well, hang on, you don't leave these agents on wounds for 24 hours, so that's not the effect you're gonna get. And what we actually found was that at 24 hours, yes, they killed a lots of biofilm in the lab, but when you went to 15 minutes, a lot of those agents worked nowhere near as well as what they did at 24 hours. When you move to an animal model, a pig pigskin model, and you soak the pigskin with biofilm on for multiple cycles uh, in an antimicrobial solution, it worked no better than saline alone. And when we moved to a human study where we soaked these uh, solutions on gauze and placed them on wounds every day for 15 minutes for one whole week, we found that they had absolutely no effect on the amount of bacteria in the wounds. Now, it's not because these agents are not effective against bacteria, because they are highly effective against planktonic single cell bacteria, such as what you might find in burns or acute infections. They kill within seconds, but against biofilm, they are significantly more tolerant to these agents. And the problem is that they're just left on for too short of a time to probably have the effect that we want, which is why I will not spend lots of money on very expensive solutions and will just use something quite cheap. I will debride, I will use an antimicrobial solution, something that's cheap to quickly just cleanse up uh, and clean up anything that's loose, any planktonic cells, any non-viable tissue that I've left. 
Uh, and then what I'll move on to is something which I can keep on the wound. Now, there's been a bit of talk about silver dressings and whether they're effective against um, biofilm. They are highly effective against planktonic bacteria. And so in burns, for example, silver is highly effective, maybe highly effective in acute diabetic foot infections. Um, but the problem is with silver against biofilm is that it's not a great level of evidence to say it has a big effect against mature biofilms. And, and there's a few reasons why. Um, typically, the concentrations of silver in most of the dressings are just far too low to have any effect against biofilm. And the other one is that um, the ionic silvers, for example, uh, can interfere with um, the EPS on biofilm. And so let me just show you this. This is a classic picture. This is my scanning electron microscope of an, an amazing diabetic foot ulcer with a chronic biofilm infection. And we can see that these cells here, these are cocci cells. This is actually probably a, funga, fun, a fungal cell. Um, but you can see that, that the biofilm is not this homogenous layer of slime over the surface of the wound, it's highly complex. It's a 3D structure. Some cells are on the surface, some are hidden really deep under this matrix. So you can appreciate how compounds or antibiotics or silver that come into contact with this EPS can be deactivated by its charge because it actually has uh, a, a different ionic charge that can uh, chelate and deactivate the silver itself. And so this is one of the primary reasons which we think silver doesn't have uh, or is not highly effective against uh, mature biofilm, but also is probably true for many other compounds as to why they just don't seem to be highly effective against biofilm. And the other is you just can't get at these, bi these cells that are really deep in the biofilm. And often these cells that are really deep in the biofilm, they switch off their metabolism virtually and just lay sort of dormant what that does is remove the target for antibiotics. So antibiotics are not that effective against biofilm cells that are located quite deep uh, within the biofilm. And also as you move through this structure, there's different oxygen gradients and that can uh, also mess with your compounds. So this picture really lets you appreciate biofilm in its, in its glory. So look, when I come to look at applying a topical agent, what I do want to what I do want to know is when I'm going to use something is that there is at least some level of evidence for its efficacy against biofilm. Okay, and if that's in vitro, then fair enough. If you've got lots of in vitro evidence, animal model, and even some human in vivo data, then then you know that's probably going to be the highest level of evidence that you can get in the absence of there being any uh, true randomized trials. A lot of stuff is in vitro, clinical or observational studies. You want something that has a broad activity though, and is pref preferably bactericidal and not static, because you want something that's actually gonna try and kill bacterial cells rather than just prevent its growth, especially when you're dealing with uh, mature biofilms that are well-established in wounds. Conversely, maybe once you've done a surgical debridement, maybe there's a role for biofilm prevention in agents that can be static, for example. But for the bulk of uh, wounds that come in your clinic, you're going to want something that, that's broad ranging. It's not selective uh, and will have a bactericidal effect. You want something which is going to offer a sustained release as well, because you don't want it just to dump everything at once. And then two or three days later, once that biofilm starts to reconstitute, you're left with nothing, no, no topical antimicrobial. And the patient's not coming back to you. So you do want something that's going to try and keep having some sort of effect between the appointments that you see them. And lastly, obviously, in most of the wounds we deal with are on the plantar surface of the foot. And so you do want a dressing that's uh, amenable to being under pressure. I love... My hydrogels, surfactant gels, um, ointments um, that have a biofilm evidence, I love using them, but sometimes they just don't work. And sometimes they just don't work because you've got them underneath the foot. And as soon as the person stands on it, it just splodges everywhere and doesn't even remain in contact with the wound. It just splodges out to the side. So sometimes you do have to think of, of those things in, in the patients um, that we have.
But ho hopefully you've you've learned uh, a few things that you can take back to the clinic with you and, and I appreciate um, you spending some time with myself and uh, Paul today. Okay, brilliant, Matt. Thanks very much for that. I really appreciate that. It was a really insightful presentation and I'm sure um, every, all our delegates have got lots of information from that. We're getting lots of questions through on, on the chat, but um, if I could just start you off really, um, you mentioned right at the end of your presentation about the use of hydrogels on the foot and um, obviously this uh, is sponsored by Flen and they're supporting this um, presentation but have you got any uh, use of with flaminil particularly as, a, as a, a, an alginate gel rather than a pure hydrogel? Yeah, I think I think one of the, the main things that I was trying to get in that sort of context is the, the sort of, a lot of... Um, what I find are, are quite effective agents uh, in these formulations are, are, are gel, hydrogels, alginate gels. Um, obviously, ones which stay uh, a lot more firmer um, are a lot better than the ones that just run and split off. But I think it was more to the concept that, that um, you know, when a clinician may use these sorts of agents under the foot or on a wound and they're not seeing the results, that they think they should be seeing. It, it may not be because it's not a good agent, just maybe because it splodges everywhere and doesn't get the opportunity to stay in contact with that foot. So I use different measures like trying to put put maybe some non-adherent gauze behind the gel so it tries to keep it in place. Um, I've used flaminol for, for many years now um, where I need to and you know, the, the primary concept with its evidence for biofilm, it does have some in vitro biofilm evidence done by, by Rose Cooper. Um, but, the, I mean, the main ingredients being sort of glucose oxidase and lactoperoxidase, they, they essentially, in biofilm, catalyze the, the glucose in, into hydrogen peroxide. And obviously hydrogen peroxide is, is um, quite effective at, at, at killing cells. Um, uh, and like many sort of of these hydrogel alginate formulations, they, they do have additional benefits of absorbing um, material, uh, for want of a better word, sort of debride. Um, and, and in doing that, uh, there has been some evidence which shows that, that doing that can maybe break some of the bonds of the biofilm or break down some of this EPS and maybe open up the biofilm a bit more so they're a little bit more susceptible um, to to therapies. Okay, great. One of the interesting things you mentioned and and we've talked about previously in, in offline conversations is this um, sort of two to three days of bringing people back into the into the clinic and uh, that's not a normal practice in the UK. Um, is that something we you would recommend doing more frequently or what happens if we can't bring back patients into clinic on so that regular basis? I mean, for me, the answer is, is yes. In part, the, we're talking about a, a, typically a small population of our patients that will have complex chronic wounds. And so if you look at the service, I mean, in the Harris Foot Service at Liverpool Hospital, um, we only do, do Harris Foot Service every day. We, we, do not, we don't do normal podiatry. So for us, our whole model of care is geared around managing complex wounds um, and, and within that we've built into the model of care to be able to do this because what we've just found is that you know if we just see these patients once every once a week or once every two weeks we just never manage to get on top of the problem so they'll come and see us specialist unit we go off the nurses the nurses will manage them they un unfortunately don't get debrided um, because they don't have a competency skill where we are um, and then they'll come back and you'll just find that, that they've just had a bit of a clean um, and some of the topical agents. And the problem is with that is when you start getting all the cellular debris, the reconstitution of biofilm, these agents just don't, they don't work as effective as what they could be is if you have the patient back a lot more frequently, picked up the scalpel, try to physically remove as much non-viable material as you can and in doing so, remove as much biofilm as you can and open up and break up and break open that biofilm so that these agents are can be a lot more effective and so i think it's a problem if we don't 
move to a concept for some of these small population of patients where we see them more frequently. We have to break this vicious cycle sometimes. And sometimes the only way to do it is just to get them back a little more frequently. And if that means doing it for one, two or three weeks, um, I'm fine with that if then I can actually then tailor them off and, and they actually heal and do better a lot quicker rather than have them going for six or 12 months, you know, where you're just seeing them on and off, you know, for every every couple of weeks. Um, but yeah, I mean, the point you touched on as well is if, if you if there's just not if it's not amenable in your model of care to do that. Then, then what you want to do is try and get them back at least once a week, give them a really good debride, and then try to use something that is effective in having a more sustained release over a period of time till you're able to see them again. Um, okay, great. I mentioned in my presentation about managing sort of overt infection and the use of antibiotic therapies in that. And I just wondered because we, we get these patients where we, we need to attack them from both ends because you've mentioned about biofilm formation. So there'll be planktonic and biofilm, I presume, is some of the wounds that we're seeing. Would you ever use antimicrobial dressings and antibiotic therapies combined as well as your debridement? Oh, most certainly, yeah. I, I think I, I try not to complicate the picture, but, but there is another complexity that I find with, with a chronic infection. And so I actually find that, that if you look at a wound, um, there's a couple of different presentations that you find with patients that come in with wounds. So you'll have acute wounds, and patients may come in with acute infections. Then you may have a chronic wound and a person comes in and also has a chronic infection. But you can also have a chronic wound where the patient experiences an acute on chronic problem. So they actually develop an acute infection or signs of an acute infection in what is a chronic wound, chronic infection. And there's a few reasons for that. We think it's it's because we know there's not just biofilm in these wounds. There are also planktonic bacteria. But there is some suggestions that, that when biofilms start to mature, sometimes they can disperse cells from this biofilm and disperse them. Or want, for want of a better word, kick them out of the biofilm. And when they kick them out of the biofilm, they sort of revert back to, well, they, they revert back to their planktonic phenotype. And so if you get lots of dispersal, you just may increase the load or the number of planktonic microorganisms. And one of the problems with that is that infection can be, or a driving factor for the initiation of infection is the number or load of bacteria that reach a quorum. And then they start to talk and go, hey, hey, there's lots of us here we're now going to cause an infection. It's, it's, it takes a lot of energy and expenditure from bacterial cells to upregulate virulence. And so they'll only do it if they know the conditions are right. Um, and so, yeah, so, so that, that is a problem where we do have patients with a, acute on chronic flares. And, and for those, we will treat those acute skin soft tissue flares um, with systemic antibiotics. It, it's a really gray area where we have patients, and, and I do have them, and I'm sure many other clinicians have seen this, with patients with chronic infections that refuse surgery, they don't want it, and that's their own right too, or they may just not be amenable to surgery. The risk of surgery is too high, and so they are on prophylactic antibiotics forever and a day six months 12 months okay um it's I've, I've just been thinking we've got lots of questions coming through but i don't think we're going to get a chance to answer many of them so just for people who we don't get the chance to answer the questions um we will uh, if you just put them in the chat um the, the communications team will send them through to us and we'll answer them individually for you offline afterwards so if you do have questions please do put them through we will get back to you after the event because we are running short of time and um but i've just got one final question for you matt really just which is is really you mentioned we can't see biofilm um we, we don't know whether it's there or not if you had to sort of say classically what what would you take on what how would you suspect that biofilm what would be your you know if if there's something you think that must be a biofilm what what are the reason if you had five things to say 
there's a biofilm there. I suspect there's a biofilm there. What are the kind of things that you would, you know, for our clinicians out there who may not be used to dealing with them in the same way that you do on a, on a daily basis, if you see a wound, what, what would be their markers for, um, for, for thinking biofilm? Yeah. I think in those scenarios, in covert infection scenarios, we, we look at secondary features. So we're not looking for maybe acute skin, erythema, redness, hot, we may be looking for more subtle features. They may be poor quality granulation tissue, friable granulation tissue, uh, undermining, pocketing, um, malodor, increasing malodor, and a stall in the wound. And, and not just one of those things, m like w the clinical features where you get two or more, I'm talking multiples of these. So, so generally, maybe more secondary features um, that would tend me to lean towards going, there's maybe a microbial component. And then maybe looking at the patient and going, well, hang on, this guy's had this wound for like six months. He's had eight courses of antimicrobial regimens and he's had everything and we've had him in clinic and he's been offloaded. He's revascularized. Um, do, it, it, it's it's got to be a biofilm. If, you know, and you've got to, you've actually got to go through and tick off all of these little tick boxes to say revascularized. Yes. Good perfusion. Yes. Being offloaded, wearing the cam boot. Yes. Nutrition. How's your nutrition? Is that good? Uh, how's your glucose control, etc. You've actually got to go through and tick, tick some of these off, but secondary signs are probably better uh, markers for, for this in addition to, to, um, having a long history of lots of antibiotics for the same wound and that wound not healing. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. I think really valuable for our uh, delegates watching this evening to have those sort of things in their heads when they've seen wounds that are not really progressing. And that whole concept of going through a, a, a sort of segmented, that are they offloaded, are they perfused, and are they, have they got the appropriate nutrition is really valuable as well. So we don't just see biofilm in isolation, but as part of that package of, of yeah. like making sure that the foot wound heals. You know, biofilms don't cause wounds in the first place. They just, they, they have a chance to come in and establish themselves once, once the person has that. You know, and a person has it because generally they're of ill health with multiple comorbidities. But, you know, I've seen wounds where I think it's got a huge amounts of biofilm affecting it. And, and, you know, we've just provided really good compression therapy and standard of care, and it's made a huge difference. Mm. So I think looking at the patient holistically is really important. And we're, we're, we're actually starting to do a really big study now where we're looking at social genomics we're actually looking at how social or environmental factors influence a person's wound uh, genes and epigenetics and how that influences biofilm and the microbiome because um, it's probably highly important i just think it, that that's in part the challenge that we face every day with our patients it's just not simple it's not pop a pill and you are done mm, absolutely i think I'm going to, at this point, I think we're going to have to close the webinar. We've done slightly over. I do apologise for people who were um, trying to keep us to time, but it's been so interesting. I couldn't really stop you, Matthew. So thank you very much for that. We've done really well with the internet as well, considering we're on the other side of the world. It does demonstrate the value of, of Teams and COVID and things. Where we've managed to have these communications and sharing your knowledge to our members, which they wouldn't normally get. So I do appreciate you sharing your time because I know it's quite late in the night for you over there. So um, I know he's uh, probably going to go straight to work after this. It's, it's some godforsaken hour. So I do appreciate that. Um, just to conclude, and on behalf of the College of Podiatry, I'd like to thank you, uh, Dr. Matthew Malone, for his excellent presentation, uh, for Orange Juice Communications for producing this for us, but most importantly also for, for Flen uh, Health for supporting this webinar, otherwise we wouldn't be able to produce this educational material for you. And most of all, I'd like to thank the delegates and the members of the College of Podiatry for attending this webinar. I hope you've got something useful from it and you can take back to your everyday practice. If you do have questions, please continue to put them in the Q&A or the chat box, and we will continue to try and answer them over the next week or two and get back to you with answers. I won't put a timeline on it because uh, Matthew's really busy, and there is also the time difference, so we'll, uh, we'll have to bear that in mind. Um, just a, a point of order for members of the College of Podiatry, the, our general, general meeting is the 26th of June. I would encourage every, all members to uh, register for that and, and use their votes wisely. And obviously we have our Summer Festival of Learning that same week um, where we've got two days of, of learning. So I would encourage you to sign up for that, which you can do as well um, through the, the college website.
Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And thank you again, Matthew, and all the people who've contributed. Thank you.